Hello, we got people here already. Holy smoke, look at you all lined up. Marvin's here. Rich, can we have an emergency stream to make up for the last time switching between streams this morning? Stop it. We're going to have a debrief after it's over. We're waiting our guest today. It's going to be David Donnelly. Who is David Donnelly? You're going to find out about David Donnelly. And he's got an interesting, very interesting story. I've wanted to get him interviewed for a while up here. Told you, Marvin, I'd interview you. We can never get your computer all up and running. It's not David Donnelly. It's David Donnelly. It's David Donnelly. David Donnelly. God, I have a hard time. By the name of Donnelly. I'll get the proper pronunciation when he gets in here. Better get the invite going. Copy. And we'll do this. Rick, welcome to the show. Good morning, everybody. So now it's just going to take David a little bit to find this thing. And when he finds this thing, he's going. I'm going to invite him up. And, uh, and then we're going to have a nice interview. He's got an interesting, very interesting story. And uh, I've got some questions for him, and we're going. To he's going to walk us through it. We're, there's going to be some links for you, all the rest of it. There is a link to David's channel in the description here, and um, I'm hoping that uh, through this you'll be interested enough, motivated enough to go. Hey, this guy sounds kind of interesting. I'd like to interview him. Can you help me out? Help David out by giving us a thumbs up so other people find that this thing's up and about. Uh, can you put a link to Deesa's channel? I can, but we're going to do it later, like right after this stream. I'm going to, we'll do a reg the rest of the morning live stream and we'll have this go on. Uh, is Dees going to run the interview? No, he's not. Hi, Andy. Welcome. Andy, I think this is Andy. Was this Andy the one that had his wife was battling cancer? One of our people whose wife was battling cancer and we just wanted to, uh, Andy. pardon me? I think that's Andy G. Yeah, Andy G. Yeah, Andy is your wife uh, battling cancer right now. I just want to uh, extend the channel's uh, my personal, uh, you know, wishes for strength and health and victory over this freaking thing. Can you ask him if he likes the Beatles? We'll ask him. Uh, would you, if you had a big star, Elton John, would you dish uh, Paul McCartney, Ringo? Sure, I probably would. And and because I mean, what would the opportunity? I'd ask David too. I'd say, would that be okay with you? You know, got McCartney wants to fucking come up. Mm. Anyway, so hopefully David will find this. <laughs> He's given up for Lent. Um, two minutes in. I hate this. I'm going to have to edit this damn thing now if he takes too long in getting in here. Because uh, three minutes is too long for anybody to watch. You know, they're waiting. Uh, but while I wait for uh, David to show, uh, actually, don't ask, if he likes it. ask him if he likes the ruddles. Yeah, we'll ask that. But cancer, I agree with that. And yes, she is. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Sue and I were talking about her yesterday. We want that. David, here's the link for you. Boom. Hit that, David. Come on up. Let's talk. So it's three minutes in. And uh, I'll tell people, I'll put a note saying, uh, join us at the three or the four minute mark where David joins us. Oh, anyway. Thrilled to have him on board with me here. Uh, no pressure. Tim, you're going to enjoy this. There is a pretty big deal. There's going to be some names dropped that you'll recognize. Uh, so you'll be happy about it because you go, holy crap, you're kidding. Really? Uh, John Lennon, David Bowie come to mind. But anyway, we're going to get him here. There he is. Hello, David. Sound check. Hiya. Can you hear me? You sound good. Marvelous. You sound very English. <laughs> yeah, God, I, I hope people aren't going to be disappointed. Nobody's going to be disappointed because a, I know how, I know how to conduct an interview. I've done a few of these. Heck you're, of a build up. Heck of a build up there. The the build up is legit. The build up is legit. Uh, I'm astounded by what I went through with some of the film clips you showed me. You're, yeah. I love your music, by the way. You're straight ahead rock and roller. I have not jumped the shark in any way, shape, or form. So many mounted guitars in that interview. Absolutely. I got two myself. Thing is, is like I can strum a few chords. Well, I know maybe 40 or 50 chords. Or I mean, it's not too bad for chords. But Dave is a working musician. He's the real deal. I'm a, a music room warrior, a, a bedroom warrior on guitar. I, but I have fun. I got an amp. I got a couple of nice amps. I crank them. I can do the thing. And I go, oh, that sounds like it's supposed to sound. Mm. You know, I've got some, a whole bunch of... Wait, I'm going. I got a bunch of 
pedals down below me. There's that uh, famous uh, boss, boss travel. Boss pedals. Yeah, I got I got I like boss pedals, they get a bad rap. Yeah. And of course, David, I'm un I'm an unabashed uh anglophile. So yes. if I'm going to get a wall, uh, uh, you know, I gotta look at that. My god. A I've, thing got a cry, I've got a crybaby myself. Yeah, well, the crybabies are generally regarded uh, somewhat higher, but the circuitry is somewhat similar, I think, at the end of the day. And originally, they were born of the same mother, for what I understand in the history of these wah-wah mm. pedals. But anyway, uh, David, let's go back. Let's find out now. So what year are you born? Because that's going to help the kids orientate and figure out what you're being exposed to when you're 13, 14, puberty setting girls are becoming a thing. And yeah. then you're going, oh, man, I'm rock and roll and I want to do this. So well, give me your year. 19. Well, you'll like this. Summer of Love, August 1967. 67. It is a great yeah. year. It is a great uh, time for music. Uh, I just picked up. Where are they? You know, we are the vinyl community. SF Sorrow, Pretty Things, 1967. Yeah. Uh, Norman Hurricane uh, Smith producing that thing. So 67, 77, you're 10. So I'm still going to say you're a little too young to be really rocking and rolling. But am I right about that or am I wrong about that? You're 10. No, you're, wrong. you're wrong about that, actually. Okay. When do you start rocking and rolling? Probably about five, six and what what was the instrument that you first uh, gravitated towards? It was drums. It was my my dad's old RAF drum kit in the basement. Royal Air Force drum kit. Yeah. Holy yeah. Drums. Now we're not talking Ginger Baker's Air Force. We're talking the literal RAF. Yeah. Was your dad was your dad a ground crew or was he a pilot? I, I believe he did, he did. He just did his national service. Okay, yeah, he got, they got him in. Right? But he, he he was always in the jazz band. He was a jazzy. Yeah. You see, there's, there yeah. there might be some jazz bones, interesting uh, stuff coming up. Who knows? Oh, isn't that interesting? So you got <laughs> yeah. So what, I mean, what? Do, so you're t you're five six years old. You get your dad's kit. It's downstairs. It's in the basement, or where is yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, it's in the basement. We had a basement in our old house and stuff. Is that rare in England to have a basement? I think it is now with new houses, but this was an old Victorian house with, oh. you know, this this was in Northampton where a Ian cellar. lives. You'd have a cellar kind of yeah. thing, you know, in the yeah, old yeah, days, yeah. right? And that was in Northampton where Ian lives. Now I'm in Norwich. Okay, so were you born in and raised, so to speak, in in Northampton? Northampton, yep, Northampton. Oh, wow. Okay. So I mean, I, I, you know, my my memories of Northampton revolve. Um, well, the reason why I'm here, I suppose, is is because uh, record collecting and stuff. I just remember Memory Lane Records was incredibly exciting yeah. because it was a second-hand record shop, and so I could buy singles for, like, pocket money prices. Yeah. Well, you they know? were like that, right? You know, like, yeah. and, and very, like, uh, for me in 1967, well, and it comes with you, when do you start buying records and stuff? How old are you? Um, my first purchased single of with my own money was 49 pence um and it was from pre d's records and it was actually i wanted the sex pistols no one is innocent innocent but my my mum wouldn't let me have it yeah um there's an irony there later on in the story as you'll know um but um i wanted that but i did love the single i bought which is boz gags lido shuffle Oh, that was a big hit over yeah. here. Well, it got a lot of play. But that's what yeah. I bought with my my own money. But previous to that, um, the band that I I absolutely was obsessed with when I was between five and and a bit now, I guess, um, was Sweet. And um, what I was obsessed with wasn't the glam rock stuff, wasn't sort of boring blitz and blockbuster. But it was like I got those singles because I kind of liked them. But then I turned it over. And their B-sides were like Deep Purple or something, you know, oh, needed a lot yeah. of loving and all that sort of stuff, rock and roll disgrace and all that. Their B-sides were so heavy, you know, and uh, their albums were like that. This arrived this morning, actually, Rachel, there you go, keeping it, keeping it on track. Sure, I got that one. I got, yeah. I got an OG of that, an American first press of that. It's really nice. Hey, look at that. It's on the old orange and uh, Capital. Old yeah. Capital. Those are the ones I bought when I was a kid, a teenager yeah. in the 70s, David. This is a Japanese one. Yeah, oh. with the with the yeah. OB there. Yeah. So so folks, if you're just joining us, we got a multi-instrumentalist, David Don Lee. Is it pronounced Don Lee or Donnelly? It's just Donnelly. Yeah, it's just Donnelly. Don no, 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 you just put an extra syllable in there. It's not Donnelly, it's just Don Lee. Okay, Donnelly. Don Lee. 
Donnelly. Donnelly. Okay. And the weird thing is, the, the weird thing is, my family are the last Donnellys in this country, and yet there are lots of Donnellys in America. I see. Yeah, well, they probably emigrated back in the yeah. past and and over the over time. I, mean, I probably would have if I could. Have. Yeah. Okay, so folks, so David, as so we're learning, we're going on a journey together here in the the course of this interview. This uh, discussion really is what it is. And uh, yeah, Don Lee like Stanley, exactly. I'm I'm getting it now. I'm slow, but there. I think I'm an extra two letters, but yeah. Bloody hell! All right, listen. <laughs> He's playing drums. He's got his dad's our old RAF kit. Now, so you're coming of age now, seventy-seven, right? Six pistols come along, seventy-seven, seventy. Yeah, that's and... the thing that really hooked me was the punk thing because. Um, by this point, I decided that I wanted to write songs, you see, but I was a drummer and, and no one takes no no one takes a drummer seriously, you know, uh, initially. So well uh, yeah, the joke is, you know, uh, what is you know, why do uh, I don't know what a band drummers play in bands because they like to hang out with musicians. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Isn't that kind of thing. Yeah. They take a large a big hit. But uh, it was, oh. when it came to drums, do you have brothers and sisters, older brothers and sisters? I have three sisters. Are they older than you? Or um, are you the two, two older and one younger. All right. Did the girls influence you at all with your own music? Not really. Um, my uh, my little sister didn't really musically come into the picture until I'd sort of left home, I suppose, really. But my two older sisters is one was into Cliff Richard and stuff like that, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. and then uh, the the eldest one was into the basically rollers. And uh, David Cassidy and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but I was more, stuff, yeah. I, I was more on the Sweet Slade, T Rex. Yeah, you're a boy. You're into the rock thing, and roll stuff, know. right? Yeah. And I think you know, seventies was the the time of, of um of the ridiculously large kid. Oh, and did they so go it always looked the... very exciting, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, because Mick Tucker from Sweet had the double oh. kick drum, very underrated drummer. Tell me, talk about Mick Tucker just briefly. Well, I, I, he was just the, the, the man with the golden arm solo on Desolation Boulevard. He, uh, you know, I used to listen to it over and over. And I actually went to his funeral to, to pay my respects. And then there was a magazine asked me if I would write an article about the funeral. So uh, so I did. And oh, uh, wow. yeah, and it, so I did pay my respects. I took a drum head down and put yeah. it by the grave and stuff. But yeah, he was, I think he was incredibly underrated. But again, it's one of those things where they got plastered, plastered with the bubblegum thing. Hard, um, hard now they had uh i forget the guy's name but chin and chapman, chapman were chapman. the two guys writing i forget the first and mickey chin or michael Ch i can't remember mm. chin yeah. and chapman writing for him they also wrote uh for blondie these guys yeah 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 yeah, yeah. pat benatar pat benatar susie quattro yeah very talented guys, but the the sweet I know we're always looking, and they're called sweet, not the sweet, but you know, sweet. We're always um, looking uh, for that independent, like on the B sides where they could put their own yeah. uh, music together and kind of find their own experience. I know that it was uh, Steve Priest that uh, wrote uh, uh, "Fox on the Run." That was his song that he wrote, and um, I was very proud. And of course, it became a big hit for him. But uh, the big hit, like um, uh, Ballroom Blitz, which was all mm. over, we loved that song as when I was a kid. Ballroom yeah. Blitz, uh, We Little Willie, uh, all these things were uh, kind of from uh, Chapman and Chin's uh, uh, productive output. So yeah. you're going. I mean, they, did, they did really well when they when they started writing for themselves. They did brilliantly with uh, Fox on the Run and Action. Um, and then I just think you know they all grew beards and it all went and you know. Well, it was near the end. There was drink like, involved, I believe. Yeah, Love is Like Oxygen, so around 76 oh. or so. And by that time, the music scene was changing a lot. 78, around, that was. 78. 78 was, that there was you go. Fun. And they'd been around for quite a while by that time. Yeah. So now they're becoming kind of the old veterans. And uh, now punk's starting to come in. And, oh. of course, the, uh, their sensibilities, things are changing again. It was and, all about the pistols guitar sound for me. That's the thing that made my ears prick up. And I thought, because I thought, well, I can't play guitar because I'm a drummer. And people who knew me, you know, like mm -hmm. your mum and dad, I say, well, you, you don't want to play guitar. You're a good little drummer, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, that's what made me want to. And I thought, I wonder if I could do this because it sounded quite simple. Like if I could just get a little bit so. That, that's yeah. how that's, that's and how I that's like your good. guitar playing. Well, you know, I could we're going to drop a link for the kids later so they can see you in action. Yeah. But they're, um, and we'll get through this. I think I got you all lined up in my um, 
thing here. You are with um, uh, the Venus reaction is your latest uh, kind of uh, working relationship. Is that correct? That's true. Yeah, that's true. And it's it's this. It's uh, but this is. I mean, this is why I wanted to come on a vinyl um, thing. This is how I sort of you know tapped into you and the rest of people. It's, it, it's yeah. because I'm a really big vinyl lover. And so when I finally got the chance to do something that was entirely kind of directed by myself, you know, written, produced and all that sort of stuff, um, I, I did, I, I had, it, it was a hard, it was a hard thing to, to release this just on vinyl, but I absolutely didn't want it on Spotify and I didn't want it on iTunes. Yeah. I, didn't, I just didn't, I wanted to have the same excitement as I had when I was a kid, you know, going down and hoping the limited edition would still be there, you know? And so, it's it's got a proper nice proper sleeve oh man i gotta get this is this available can i get this yes yes it is a, it's a, it is available and um as you can see by the back the um the other musicians are amy conradine who's the singer um i'm doing the guitars glenn matlock um currently in blondie formerly sex pistol and um he's on bass and ed graham from the darkness is the drummer because i i honestly i mean ed always argues with me about this but i keep saying he said why don't you do the drums you can do the drums but i say it's, yeah not like ed ed's ed's an amazing drummer but he can't see it and of course i had to uh transparent uh yeah. line on there and the guitar <laughs> on the cover for the yes label. that's actually from a gig in liverpool that didn't end well for me Oh, it sounds like looks like you might have had a little difficulty. Uh, yes, I did. Down. I did. And uh, and if you absolutely must, there's a download card that comes with it with the two tracks and loads of photos and and. All and right, that. let's get a link for this, uh, David. Uh, so you're are you are you on Bandcamp? Where can we? Yeah, get it's on? just it's just Bandcamp. The Venus reaction. Okay, let me get on there and follow you and order this thing up myself. I want to get it before it all goes. The Venus. Yeah, the there Venus. really aren't very many. Um, I only did five hundred in the first place, and they are selling in Australia, Japan, and yeah, it, like you know, all over Europe. There you are. Okay, and I am of course follow follow supported by. I'm God follow. Boom! I am now following. Yes, please. Cool, blimey! Um, Leave it out, Governor. Yeah, there we go. Now, listen, you also have a YouTube presence. I'm going to drop your link on YouTube. You are currently boasting 128. <laughs> 100, he's got 128 subscribers. So you're interested in David. And I think I'm sure you will be by the time we finish. Because, David, you've played on some big stages. You've played with some big names. I'm absolutely uh, gobsmacked uh, <laughs> as I look at these things. I'm chuffed. I'm absolutely thrilled when I read the, some of this stuff. Like, you've got a video with you on there uh with uh earl slick of all yeah people. yeah earl slick playing with john lennon david yeah. bowie unbelievable guy like he's yeah over everything and when you you mentioned you mentioned earlier that you were talking um you were with sue on the night that lennon was yeah. murdered yes. and uh yeah when i was working with earl slick he was you know he just comes out with these stories and stuff and i didn't realize that you know he's working on that album with john lennon at that yes, time yeah. and to hear someone like Earl, give you the sort of the details of like getting the phone call and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I, that, that was shivery, you know. The immediacy of it all. Our yeah. friend, our mutual friend, George Borden, has worked with Jack Douglas, who is the producer on Double Fantasy. And of course, he has his recollections of all that period of time. Yeah. Around. As we all do, but to be at the very epicenter, I mean, I mean, God, you're if it's a bullseye. Yoko's the bullseye with John, you know, that close. But these people at that time, creative, uh, creatively, Earl Slick and uh, Jack Douglas, these guys are right in the studio working with John right up to the end. It was very sad. It was one of the most shocking events in my life. Uh, surpassed probably only by 9-11, which just was absolutely... Yeah, it's stunning. I remember where I was. I was in Northampton having breakfast and uh, getting ready to go to school, I believe. And, uh, oh, thank you, Terry. That's yeah, we want we want people to uh, to support you, David. And I think I think you're I mean, you're you're going to go. I predict good things for you in terms of YouTube and everything else. You're very personal. I'm so grateful to you for taking time because I knew this would be good. I'm absolutely fascinated by the whole thing. So at what age are you when you decide, hey, I'm coming off dad's RAF kit and I think I'm going to lug this monster out to the local FET or, you yeah. know, or you go to some 
event and you start i mean you've played on some big stages this, i have I, but i also I, I remember also um just lugging the kit to school when i was i don't know i must have been about eight or something and 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 uh in assembly i did the man who man with the golden arm solo from sweets desolation boulevard although i suspect it wasn't quite as good well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but you're young. Did, did you have influences? Were you looking up like Cozy Powell or people like this or Mick Tucker? Yeah, I was fascinated by it all. I couldn't, I couldn't get enough of, couldn't get enough of. I mean, Top of the Pops again. I know there's a lot of people watching. Well, not watching this maybe, but might watch this later and just think, oh yeah, okay, Granddad. But there was a time where you had to tune in at seven o'clock on a Thursday to watch Top of the Pops, and it was yeah. the only really decent music program um and there was also old gray whistle test but you know that was a bit later up at night and um so it was just incredibly exciting and and uh i i've just obsessed with it all and then finally in in after you know getting a sort of fill of the punk thing and what have you in 1981 i met uh, a, a person who's still a friend today which is lol lol tolhurst from the cure i went to go and see them in norwich at a fairly small venue it's 1981 and um and they were obviously they were known because they're playing a venue. I think it's the it was the Faith tour, yeah. and um, and I ended up talking to Lowell Tolhurst afterwards, and we exchanged addresses. And um, wow! And then that ended up with me in 1984 going to stay with um, Lowell for a bit um, in London and stuff, and ended up going to the rehearsals, being in the studio with them and stuff. It was. Uh, it were you it. somewhat? It is nor. I mean, it, the idea at this time you're in uh, Northamptonshire. Were, were you? Did you see yourself as something of a, a provincial out there? You know, in the country and coming into the big city of London. Uh, more like so, your, more so when I moved to Norwich. To be honest, when I was eleven, we moved to Norwich. Okay. And then yeah, Norwich is, uh, you know, Norwich is is East Anglia. Yeah, so you're on the East Coast there. Yeah, but I love it now because I mean, if you make if you if you if, if you make a living making a row you know making a noise i just people find it i think they find it quite odd that i come back and they'll say oh do you want to come down to brickmakers you know local venue sort of thing it's like no i, I don't really because it's like a busman's holiday isn't it hello david You've so this is holiday. this is absolutely fascinating to me so i mean you're just sitting there and there, there's an accessibility i'm sensing that you can just go talk to these people i mean here's a guy in the cure you go Hey, hi, I'm David. I'm, you know, I played drums a bit, or maybe by this time you're starting. I did, yeah. Well, I was, I was only about thirteen, but I sort of was a bit sort of like, hello, I play drums too, and he said, yeah. oh, well, I'll keep in touch, sort of thing. And then, obviously, over the next three or four years, the cure just went through the sky. Holistic, yeah, you know, and it's weird now. I, I find it weird when I see Robert on telly, and uh, but it's also. Um, it can be sad sometimes when Andy Anderson died, who was the drummer that was around when I was sort of down in London with them. Uh, um, when he died, um, Lowell sent a message over to the memorial with his wife and stuff and said his little bit. And, and Robert sent a poem to be read out. And yeah. then I, I gathered like a couple of extra um, uh, orders of service. Um, because I thought maybe Robert should have one, you know, I thought Robert should have one. And then I suddenly realized, geez, like both his parents are gone now. I haven't got his number, his parents' number in Crawley. And he, I knew he'd moved from the house that he was in when I kind of knew him. Um, and I suddenly realized, oh, that's, that's sad because there's no way I'm ringing up a record company and going, oh, I'm an old friend from way back, you know. Yeah, and and sometimes they, that's, yeah, they'd go tongue in cheek and say, "Sure you are." Yeah, yeah, sure you are. And I just wanted, I just wanted to send him a copy of Andy's yeah. uh, memorial service thing because it was nice, and Andy was a yeah. lovely guy, and we all miss him, I'm sure, you know. But I, yeah. I, I'd love yeah. to see Robert again, but it's just difficult. I'm not, um, I'm not in that loop now because Lowell left in 1989 after disintegration. What a great album, disintegration, yeah. and one of their recognized one of their best. You know, mm. it's a fantastic band, iconic, and every most they have they're one of those bands that have a lot of cachet. The Cure, so yeah, this is amazing. I, 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 oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, David. no, I was just going to say that I'm trying to make this interesting because me myself is not very interesting. This is a record I think collecting. Very interesting. I think this is this is a record collecting podcast. So most people would call this the the Cure's like, you know, top album, pornography yeah. album from 1982, and as you can see, they've got. Um, they're all very fuzzy on the sleeve and what have you. Yeah. But this is one of the only the three shirts 
that they were wearing on the front of that cover. Oh, look at that. And this is, uh, Lol gave this to me when, when I had a bit of a disappointing time in London at one point, and he gave me this. He said, there you go, look, there's my pornography shirt. And that's that's the shirt well, on the screen. What, a, yeah. what a, um, a piece of memorabilia there. Yeah, uh, and I've got a pair of Robert Smith boots upstairs as well. Holy smoke. So you could actually, if you have, you know, if you're in the mood, get the hair all teased up and away. <laughs> I might you, start my own hard rock cafe. I The cure never looked better to me than when it was Robert, you know, the main guy, Robert Smith. Mm. He's got his hair all teased up, the lipstick, the whole bit. But then the other guys would have their hair and they were like a little creatures from yeah, another yeah. planet. I Simon's got really him. mad, the bass player, Simon Gallup. His, his hair went huge in the late I 80s. just love that. And when you see them like that, when they're at that stage, when those videos, because uh, MTV was taken over over here in North America, up in Canada, uh, much music we had. But these guys were unavoidable. And you didn't want to avoid them. They were just absolutely adorable. So many great hits. Uh, mm. The Cure, just a, an amazing, one of our best bands to come out of the 1980s. So here you are. You're a 13-year-old kid. You're obviously impassioned about music this time. You're a punker. You're into this sort of thing. And you're starting to reach out and you're contacting people. And But how is it that you ended up getting involved with so many people? Like you find yourself on stage with, um, God, uh, Earl Slick. And the other guy I noticed here that you were in was, was the late. We just lost him. This is, must have been horrible for you. Keith Levine from yeah. uh, PIL. Uh, from yeah, that's, on, that's really yeah. that was really really sad, and I think his video, me and him playing at the Hundred Club, I think is the biggest video on my YouTube. And I popped Club. it up just when yeah. he died. And... Now the Hundred Club is one of these storied Soho venues. Yeah, that, you know people do. It's right up there with the Marquee, the Hundred Club, the Marquee, the, and I've been to uh, to Soho, and I you know I got a picture outside the Marquee. Because, yeah. yeah. 90 Wardour Street, you know, so many iconic bands playing at the 100 Club, the mm. Marquis, uh, Ronnie Scott's, so all these venues there. And you're right at the center. You're the right age at the right time. Maybe you're a little too young. Like, you're just, if you've been yeah. a little bit older, what do you say? Have you ever yeah, thought yeah. about that? I mean, in the 90s, I was in a band called Stare that was signed to Big Life Records. And, and uh, I remember we did a showcase at the Marquis. And uh, we actually have a list of Stare stare atrocity list we called it where we just had such bad luck like when the first single came out the art department forgot to put a barcode on the back of it so it didn't get any chart things okay. you know for it to go through and then we did this marquee gig showcase and during the sound check i remember looking to the singer and we sort of raised our eyes because it sounded like someone really slammed a door loud and i was going like jeez and i said something stupid like oh shut the door why don't you and then about 10 minutes later, the place just started filling with police. And we were all told to get out. And a bomb had gone off in Tottenham Court Road. Oh, no. And uh, no. our showcase was um, was not as it should be. Yeah, it was uh, shut down prematurely, obviously. They shut the whole thing. It's like going out. It's like that film 28 Days Later. You yeah. sort of stepped out of the marquee and there's like no one there sort of thing. So. Yeah. So let's let's draw the connections here. So how do you how do you so you 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 go up you meet the guy from the, the Cure that's all happening mm -hmm. and, and then but when do you get start carrying your kick onto these stages? What's the first real proper gig you had and how'd you get it? Again, it was a school band. I remember we hired we hired like a, a youth club or something and uh, put our school band on there. And then like everyone else, because I'm just very conscious that people watching are going, who are you anyway? Um, so. <laughs> Basically, if we if we just steam forward, obviously there's loads of bands, my own bands, trying to trying to do my own thing and what have yeah, you. Like, your we, age, this yeah, a uh, really good band called Pressure. We did three self released albums, um, but we just couldn't. I was in a band called Ivy, um, in in doing drums and what have you. That was uh, this is our English single, and then this is our Spanish only single, not Spanish Are language. Are these Thanks. things still available? I mean, can anybody get they're them? They're on Discogs. They're on Discogs if you don't mind shelling out for them. Yeah. Um, but they're not they're not available for me or anything. No, these are 90s. Um, it's great that you still have copies for yourself, Dave. Yeah, I do. Oh, I, I'm, de I'm the archivist, believe me. Yeah. You know, um, I might have Patrick's title, but but for me, <laughs> I have got, I've got a me, me, me shelf, which I always laugh 
that. No, it, you know, it's it's great because it's creative. It's art. Uh, were yeah. you good at or Were you good at maths? I think the English you folks call them maths. Were you good? No, at, or I, you I was a pure artist. No, I pure artist, unfortunately, in that, um, which is, I, I guess that's a very nice and cuddly way of saying I was a bit thick at school. <laughs> I no, I, I don't, don't think, I don't see it that way at all. Were, were you also driven to, or drawn to, pardon the pun, to drawing, to painting, this sort of thing? No, but my dad was a an artist for a living. That's what he was. That's what he did. My dad was an artist and, and a jazz man. Yes, Sarah Records Heart Ivy. That is, yeah, because there's an Ivy in the States and we kept having to call ourselves UK or Ivy UK. Whenever yeah, I just, yeah. I just ordered up, uh, David, this is a band you may know of, the UK Nirvana. Oh, um, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. There, and they have to, yeah, and they had to do a settle out of court because they challenged the American band because they predated the Americans. Yeah, yeah. By, you know, yeah, some yeah. years. And there was a settling so they could use the, you know, Kurt and the boys could continue to use the, mm. the thing. So at what age do you start? You got your drums. You're going, you obviously have a long love for the drums. Of course, uh, our friend mm -hmm. Angelo Kelly is uh, impassioned about the drums as well uh, and uh, is very good by all accounts. Where do you, when do you, when does the guitar come into play for you? How old are you then? And uh, I see a, 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 an affection for the Les Paul brand yeah. of guitar in particular. When does that come? How does that happen? It's, it's a Steve Jones thing. Um, and that's what made me want to play guitar. And so 14, 15, 16, um, uh, I, I was just Steve Jones. I actually collect Steve Jones records. To a fault. I mean, Is I've even got a I've, genius. Uh, it wouldn't tell me about Steve. Let's talk Steve Jones kids for the uninitiated. He's a guitar player for the Sex Pistols. And I want to tell you one of the best, shortest, most powerful ripping guitar solos I ever heard. EMI. One, EMI. I just yeah. freaking love that thing. It's just my God. It's ear candy. It's rock and roll. It's pure rock and roll. And it's so straight ahead. And everybody thinks, oh, you know, this Sid Vicious can't play. And these guys all suck. And you listen to Steve Jones and you go, you got a guitar player with some real skill. Now, I'm seeing multiple cons copies of this. What's going on here with this? It's the Steve Jones solo album, Mercy. I've got the Japanese, American, and English. Uh, plus fans, the CD yeah. cassette and and in the reissue um of Fire and Gasoline Steve Jones's Fire and Gasoline album I did I um I get a thank you for the sleeve notes which is quite nice that was a nice on, on the Steve Jones album you got yeah. a, you're in the credits there? yeah on the reissue of uh, Fire and Gasoline so <laughs> okay so if he's thank you so obviously he's met you I would assume probably maybe more than once yeah I remember when I first met him and um I was uh, the first professional job I ever had in terms of like actually getting a wage and what have you. I was the Steve Jones in a Pistols tribute band. And uh, we, we actually played all around the world. Um, you know, we, we honestly, we did like three American tours. We went to Brazil. We, we toured Europe about six times. It was mad. But um, because by this point I'd met Glenn and we were friends, uh, I went to the Pistols in 2008 when they did their big run at uh, Brixton Academy, five nights at Brixton Academy. Yeah. And um, afterwards, Steve Jones was uh, knocking about and various, you know, we were just hanging out. And uh, I said, you'll find this hard to believe. But I said, um, I used to be you, you know, because I because yeah. I, I was. And he went, how do you mean? And I said, oh, I, was, I was the Steve Jones in the Pistols tribute band. And he looked me up and down. And he went, you need, to make, you need to eat a few more fucking pies <laughs> to be me. <laughs> Yeah, and it, <laughs> Steve's gone on to do his own radio show. And oh, and he, yeah, but I collect, fun guy, I, I collect everything that he did, whether it's the production stuff with the Avengers, which yeah. he also plays on the Generation X last album, because you know, uh, and um, and like everything. And I even the other day, yeah. um, if you remember when I popped up the other day on your, uh, I, I was writing in there and I said I bought my first ever Bob Dylan vinyl, yeah, and and then I said it was into the groove. And everyone was going, what? yeah, because that's, it's not, that's not yeah. Stuff. yeah. But the thing is, on on the band, on the on the song, Sally Sue Brown, um, Steve Jones does the guitar solo. Yeah, I saw his credit on uh, on Dylan. Yeah, so, so I mean, this is absolutely wonderful. I Sex Pistols. I I came, I came to them late because uh, for my own story, David, I became a, a Christian person in mm -hmm. around 1970. Yeah, seven seventy eight. So right as the punk scene's breaking, I did that. But I caught up to him about 1980, 81, 
and I yeah. grabbed the Sex Pistols because there was so much, you know, talk about them. I said, "What's this?" And never mind the bollocks. I got. I guess I got to get to see what this is. And yeah. I picked up a cassette tape. So that's how I was introduced Sex Pistols mm. on my own, just because it was in the um, ethos of the time that you know there was a lot of talk on radio and television. This thing about Sex Pistols. I said, oh, "I got to check these guys out," and they mm. blew me away because of Steve Jones. He's my favorite uh, component of the band because of the guitar, mm. the hooks he could come in. Uh, uh, what is the one holiday? Is, holidays uh, in the sun, yeah. Holidays in the sun. The, and, 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 you know, he could do those little hooks in there that I just yeah. absolutely, I go, holy crap, just screaming guitar, you know. Yeah, it's, Man, amazing. it's, it's amazing. So how old are you when you uh, when you stumble across uh, guitars? Uh, Steve Jones, your guy. So you grab a Les Paul or a Les Paul copy, maybe an Apple phone or something. Yeah. Hold on a sec. Sorry, yeah. can I? Somebody's yeah. just come to the door. I need to just. Tell them, tell them you're on TV. Folks, if you're just joining us, we're talking with David Don Lee. And hi, Rose. Welcome to the show. We got Rose. She goes, hi, bye. She can never stay long because um, she's very busy and doesn't have a wrench. She doesn't have a proper spanner. All right. Now, welcome. Sorry about that. That's actually, that's actually uh, bizarrely enough, my mother has just turned up to, to visit me. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you want to get Mama on the interview? <laughs> no. Does she want I, to come in? I, no, I she doesn't. Have... I don't want to cause trouble for your dear mom. Yeah, um, no, she's just popped around, I think, to just uh, pop something off. I'm, uh, yes. Yeah, but the thing is, is that everybody rips off everybody, Stephen Schnee. Yeah, but the pistol yes. is the holidays of sun from the jump in the city. Yeah, but it's how they make it their own, and that's the secret of rock and roll, you know? Yeah. Everybody's ripping off everybody, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Led Zeppelin, so. Greta Van Fleet, come on, give me a break. Oh, so I know. It's just three, three chords and the truth, man. That's what you want. You just yeah. want to rock straight ahead, rock and roll. And the pistols were all that. And that was yeah. what everybody loved. And everybody loved that. My, like people like me that were rockers during the disco thing. I was all rock. Mm -hmm. And we fought against it. And, and I remember in bars, you know, arguing with people about all this disco. Yeah, yeah. Like, BGs, disco, give me a break. Um, so, anyway, how old were you when you picked up the guitar? Uh, well, I'd say when I picked it up, I was about sort of 13, but I only 13. really sort of put it to any good use when I was sort of 17, 18 and yeah. starting to, to write stuff. And why? Because yeah. obviously once I learned to play the guitar, I could do the drums, guitar and the bass. So I yeah. could actually start writing songs, putting them onto a cassette and handing them to the band I was in and going, look, don't laugh. I know I'm the drummer or whatever. And then yeah. I became the guitarist on the, you know, various things. And like I said, it was um, I initially my first professional going professional with this pistols tribute band which i was in for four years and i got to know glenn during that time he'd asked me to come down to london and and do a rehearsal with him and chris musto okay. as a guitarist so um, I, got, I got you some of your rock here i'm picking it up for the kids to watch uh you know so they can get a sense of what you're doing and and mm. just how straight ahead rock and roll the whole thing is um but keep going. Sorry. To but yeah, yeah. And so, um, so uh, th that didn't really come to anything. The, the trio with me as guitarist, and then sort of like a few years later, once I'd been in this Pistols tribute band, I always got the idea when I spoke to Glenn that he kind of want he would have liked me to be involved in stuff, but not really while I was in a Pistols tribute band, which I get, I get it. You yeah. Know? Um, but uh, yeah, it just I'd had enough after a while, after about four years. Um, of, of globe trotting as it were and i wanted to sort of do something a bit more um you know with, with a bit more bite to it and what have you and so funnily enough i, I sent uh glenn a, a text message on the day of the reading festival and um and i remember him sending straight back and going oh could you help me out with a gig that i'm putting on sort of thing you know that 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 sort of thing and so then eventually i took over from um javier from the stereophonics who was who was glenn's drummer at the time yeah. And uh, I did the Canadian tour of 2010 with my first thing. And then since then, Glenn's used me on and off for whatever he needs. He's doing a different thing at the moment. He's doing more sort of, I wouldn't say it's rockabilly, but it's got a bit more of that sort of strut to it. You know, he's yeah. done some stuff with Slim Jim Phantom. His latest album has got Clem Burke on it, who's, who's a friend of mine too. Okay, saw yeah, him, I saw him a couple of weeks ago, actually. Saw him a couple yeah. of weeks ago. Blondie and also, of course, Ramones. He was a, a Ramon for he a, was Elvis, Elvis Ramon for a while, wasn't he? And also, uh, when you mentioned Slim Jim Phantom, of course, uh, Whiskey a Go Go fame, uh, Strange yes. Cats, 
Um, so, I mean, he was the uh, with the stray cats back in the day. Didn't he? Wasn't he the one that was dating Cher for a while, of all things, Slim Jim? I think he was. I think he dated Cher. No, no, he know. he was. He it's Britt Eklund. Britt Eklund? Yeah, yeah. Britt Eklund, uh, yeah. Rod Stewart's other girlfriend. He was with Britt for a while. But got, anyway, I have a feeling he was with Cher for a heartbeat, too. Just, yeah. I just seem to remember that, too. Yeah. But, uh, you know, back in the day, back in the day. I've actually got Slim's biography because I tour managed him for a tour. Actually, that was another job I had, which I, I tour managed, him, and I, I've got a copy of his autobiography, so I really ought to have yeah. known that. But uh, that's I amazing that you're, it. yeah, that you're able to uh, to uh, encounter and be because you're a younger guy than all these people that you're talking. These guys, like you're in '67, and these people are more my age that you're yeah. now with that are about ten or eleven years older than you are. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, Britt and Peter Sellers as well. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what um, my basically once got Glenn is you know I've got to give Glenn Glenn is the sort of touch paper that got lit, and that's when I started working with more more of the people. I did something for Glenn, and I met this guy called Tom Wilcox who was organising a boat uh, an Iggy Pop thing mm -hmm. at uh, the ICA in London, and it was the 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 uh to play the whole of the blah blah album blah 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 album from start to finish yeah and it had andy anderson from the cure on drums it had kevin armstrong from iggy's band and and um david bowie of course a team to turn as keyboard player um i had erdl kizzle k who was bowie's bass player and and what have you but on the songs where erdl also played violin like winners and losers and cry for love um i was the bass player i took over from bass and that that was that's nerve wracking, you know. Yeah, well, Having it's not to... your main instrument for one thing, right? Yeah, but also, have, have you ever heard Erdl Kizzle play, uh, Kizzle K play on like like the Glass Spider tour and stuff? He's one of the best bass players in the world. So to have you know his... what I saw Glass Spider, like uh, that was a, the one time wow. I saw Bowie. It was the Glass Spider tour. Peter Frampton was out there with him. Tony Basil of all people was in part yeah. of that. It was an absolutely massive show. It wasn't. I don't think the best for Bowie overall. He, he's such a huge the charisma, one of the most charismatic performers I ever saw. Amazing charisma. But yeah. the, it was such a big Broadway kind of production. I was just, holy crap, boy. You know, yeah, yeah. Get, saying get Ronson and just rock it, you know, get Trevor Boulder back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. But uh, but it was a big show. So this well, is a bass player with Bowie. Yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I ended up in Holy Holy. Um, I'm sure that Trevor Boulder would have been part of Holy Holy, which was Woody Woodmansey's um, yeah. Bowie thing. Woody Woodmansey and Tony Visconti later. Um, but first it was Woody Woodmansey. Yeah, uh, and you played with those guys too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the, bass, I was the original bass player for that. So and, you were uh, in basically a revamp spiders from Mars to basically, yeah, yeah, through. yeah, basically, and and um, we do Ziggy and, and and all that thing, but the it kind of got serious when the band did like the whole of Man Who Sold the World from start to finish, and and Tony Visconti came in because, um, I mean, I I went because obviously if Tony wants to play bass, I I I didn't I wasn't really going to stand there and go, no, yeah, no. well, who are you? Um, but I was put on rhythm <laughs> guitar for a little bit. Um, and then eventually they, they, I think they just needed to turn it into an all star band. So they got the singer from heaven 17 and Glenn Gregory, Gregory. Yeah. Um, he's really good. And I actually, I actually crewed for that lineup. You know, I'm not proud. I just, cause I wasn't in, I'd rather be in the band, but if I can't be in the band, I've got to make it. So. I mean, is massive. I mean, is a T-Rex Mark Brol Boland's producer. He's with Dean yes. Boy. He's producing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy. I mean, this is astounding stuff. And and also he was married to uh, one of my favorites from back in the day was Mary Hopkin, the little Welsh girl. Uh, he married uh, Mary Hopkin, which is uh, uh, a lot. Of, I don't know who knows that, but it's one. Yes, of the things I yeah, yeah. Uh, Well, obviously, I mean, on the tour, on the Holy Holy tour, the um, the support acts were Jessica, who's yeah. Tony's daughter, with Mary Hopkin. Um, and she's brilliant as well. Check out, mm. you know. So yeah, beautiful lady, and of course. Uh, uh, yeah. One of the roles that was signed to and the his son, Apple label. And his son, Morgan Visconti, was the second support as well. And they, yeah. you know, they, he's, I loved his album, uh, Morgan Visconti. He was really fantastic. And so, um, but yeah, funny enough, it, it's really weird. One of the reasons I love your show, Rachel, is when I'm listening to Mazzy or I'm listening to The Waxed or yeah. whoever it is, is on it. I always, 
continually. I mean, you've said several things today that I could have jumped in and told a story about because it was just happened to be a thing. And it's like you, you mentioned Tony, and I'm, like, and I'm off because there's so many brilliant things about that guy. And I, I um, like I say, I, I'm conscious of, of um, just babbling on. But I thought I'd show you this. I thought you might like this. This was given to me. It's uh, oh, there's Z Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders of Mars soundtrack, the yeah, red vinyl. And red you vinyl. Put it autographed all over. Well, it just says on the front, it's from Tony and, and, and Woody. And it just uh, Tony says to Marvelous Dave, love you, man, Tony Visconti. And then this one says to David, you're a real star, Woody Woodmansley. Wow. Um, and you know, it's sad because these and, big fans, you know. And there's a couple of Tony Visconti plectrums I nabbed off the stage. Hang on, they're uh, guitar picks for you people that uh, don't know all about all this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> pluck them. But uh, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, Tony Visconti is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, Angelo Kelly, a fellow recording artist, says, I have just ordered the Crashing Up 7. Great interview. Uh, awesome. Here's the links, kids. You can get the stuff. I'm going to play a little bit of David in action. Do you mind if I uh, play a little bit? What, I what know you it never sounds great. But What are you uh, going to play? Right. What I thought I would play for the kids, because I love the guitar in it, is Peaceful Cacophony. Okay, set me free. Set me free, set me free full, full length first edit. Yeah, I just I'll say before you do this, yeah. I'll just I'll just say that the woman who my my musical partner in Peaceful Cacophony, Denise Wise, is you know we we know that the 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 music industry is ageist and sexist. Yes, but I just love the fact that at a certain age, I'm just going to say at a certain age. She just decided she wanted to make a an album, a rock album, um, and uh, I just admired that, you know, that Hutzpah so much. Um, yeah, sure is what I it's say. been brilliant. So yeah, this is yeah. Yeah, okay. no, that, you're absolutely right there because the youth focus. I mean, rock and roll is, you know, it's a vicious game, as April Wine, the Canadian mm. band, once saying. Mm. And uh, and women have a harder time of it, but we fortunately we do have some older women that uh, uh, continue to make music and excel in it, and are highly yeah. regarded. And uh, so that never lets uh, that never stops me for a heartbeat. Uh, yeah. But I anyway, I love this song, and I wanted to play. This is the one I selected. I think I hope right. you like it, kids. All right. I hope it doesn't bore people at home. Sorry, just turn it up and enjoy it. Listen, okay, well, listen, we may not play the whole thing, but no, you know, no. I just want to give a sense of it and just let's rock and roll a little yeah. bit, okay? I got to be able to play this for your collective edification vinyl community. <coughs> This was filmed on the hottest day of the year. Yeah. 
Yeah, Terry. I know what you mean. Fantastic, man. It's a straight ahead rock and roll. It's got boogie, you know, the amp, 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 amp. Well, I like that you played that because that's actually one of Denise's songs. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we write together, yeah. but every now and again, Denise will just put a song forward, and then every now and again, I'll put a song forward, and I'll yeah. say, Do you mind singing these lyrics or whatever? But that's one of Denise's set me free. Well, I mean, you, yeah, you're clearly a gifted guitar player. I mean, you, I don't know what you rate your own self, but I mean, man, that is just in the pocket for me. It's, it's just why I call it straight ahead. Rock and roll. It's got that great boogie uh, shuffle going on there, which is in a million songs. Mm. But that's the heart of it, man. That's but the thing. Is, the thing is, on that, on, yeah. on that, and anything with peaceful cacophony. Obviously, I'm playing the drums, the bass, the keyboards, and the guitar. On yeah. There. So you, just, I was going to ask that. Yeah. It's so just you're doing all of that. Mm. Uh, real drums, kids. Yes. <laughs> real drums. Real drums with skins yeah. and sticks and. All that. Folks, once again, I'm going to get uh, out there on David's uh, band camp. Uh, copy, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. There's a peaceful, there's a peaceful cacophony YouTube and band camp, and there's a Venus Reaction YouTube as well as the band camp. And the third one, if I, I'll bring it up, seeing as you probably will in a moment, but the other one is Choose Your Weapon, which is me and two ladies. Ladies. Um, choose Your Weapon. And that's basically me doing all the music yeah. and production. Jamie, who's a burlesque dancer, so definitely worth checking out. Now, folks, and, in the, um, uh, you know what I'm going to do as well, David? Yeah. Is I'm going to put links in the description of this video so people can go over there and, uh, you know, access all this stuff. So yeah. they can you, please consider uh, supporting David's channel, helping him out. I love that, but I, I love how you often mention that to people and stuff. It's not, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I, it's, when it comes to subscribers and that, I, I don't care. It's kind of like, I want people who love, if they're looking for something that I've done, you'll find it there. It's brilliant. You don't have to like, you don't have to subscribe. I, I haven't got the arrogance to sort of say, oh, I should have thousands. You know what it is? So I think people genuinely, they, they enjoy, like when we have a guest up like this with yourself, they go, man, I like this guy. I like what he's talking about. Yeah. 
I'm I'm into this. So what is the channel? I do want to subscribe. How the hell? And they'll often ask me, how hey Rachel, can we have a link for David's channel? Where's the link? Is there a link? Where can yeah. we get this? You know, and so and I think I think the I'm most interesting things. I think the most interesting stuff on my channel is things like as long as you spell my name right, you'll find it. It's just David Donnelly. Yeah. And uh, but on YouTube. But I love things like there's about a minute and a half clip of just the walk from the dressing room when uh, my band Atlantic Machine played, um, we played Liverpool Echo Arena, which is 16,000 people. Yeah. Tell, me um, about the, tell me about your bloody guitar on that uh, record label. Oh, I will. Yeah, that was actually, that was Liverpool. Um, not, not that, that was not, the, that was years earlier. But yeah, that was when I was playing guitar in a band. But I, I was the drummer in um, Atlantic Machine. Yeah. But as we walked down the corridor to go to the stage and stuff, had someone filming me from behind i'm sort of putting in me in ear monitors and stuff and putting my backpack making sure that we go through this yeah just a normal corridor and then you open it and you suddenly realize you're behind the stage and you've got the little mini tv studio from the, for the guys that are, are working the screens the sort of you know 50 foot screens either side and stuff and i that always gives me chills and i always think that's a good thing that so people say you know what's it like going on stage in a big gig and that well that that minute and a half two minutes or whatever it is that that gives you the idea of what it's like because no one's talking to each other we're just walking along my guitar roadie's ahead and my roadie sorry is, is ahead and he's taking yeah, yeah liverpool. liverpool well radio gnomes uh, it's from the pool yeah so he knows he knows what liverpool echo arena is yeah. and uh so that's really good and then there's another one of um when we played this amphitheater in scarborough and that's got us kind of there's tiffany laura um jim and myself and and it's just like following us around just going to the dressing room doing the sound check on this ridiculously large yeah place it's like an amphitheater you know and it's i, I like that sort of stuff on there but really youtube and, and even my own facebook really for photos and stuff it's just it's a place to put stuff that i i like yeah. watching it you know i like seeing it you know it's interesting to see the evolution of certain performers like uh, i guess the big one is uh Justin Hook is rides again. Yes, yes. Uh, he's done so well uh, with this thing, you know, because the darkness isn't the biggest band in the world, but he's been he's rubbed shoulders with the most famous of the famous. Yeah, he's been I've there. been I've been with Ed. I've been I've been with Ed, the uh, the original drummer Ed Graham, yeah. um, for the last few days and stuff, and he's like quite he's quite excited because it's twenty years since Permission to Land. And they're putting out a five vinyl box set. Oh, five, okay. This five is vinyl. something a lot of people would and they're also Yes. There's also a four CD and one DVD edition coming out as well. Yeah. And um, and I said, gosh, you're going to have a good Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Because You know, one of, one of my favorite music stories, Dave, is when uh, Pete Best finally on Anthology, they included him on a number of songs there. Yeah. And the guy became a millionaire overnight. And I just oh. thought how wonderful that was. Because, you know, as far as publicly, maybe the, there's stuff that went on behind scenes I'm not familiar with. But yeah. at least publicly, uh, the Beatles never really, you know, here's a million pounds for you. You know, have some fun mm. with that. Uh, it never really seemed to have. Certainly, in the case of Pete Best, it didn't. And it was nice to see the guy. Yeah, because you know, he's got his family and kids and stuff. And it's nice for him to have his day. Plus, I did love the artistic. What do you call it? Artistic revenge or uh, justice is when he had his uh, his moment. The Beatles who ripped his face out of Ringo's drummer. You know, it's him on the yeah, kit. yeah. They rip him out, and then he did an album, Pete Best, a green album with just a little triangle. It's that little rip piece that was on the anthology put on the cover. I thought it was genius. A great that's, that's pretty good. Uh, here's a question: Link Ray is the father of the power chord. Why is Link Ray never given full credit for giving us the power chord? Link Ray, great guitar player. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't aware of what the, you know, what the timeline would be. But yeah, Link Ray, I can imagine. Link Ray, like 1958, yeah. Rumble, and of course, uh, in the Play It Loud documentary with uh, Jack White and The Edge and yeah. uh, Jimmy Page, uh, you've got that uh, uh, scene where Jimmy Page has got the, you know, the documentarian. He goes, here, yeah. you want rock and roll? Listen to this. He grabs the 45 of Rumble. And you can just see Jimmy Page, just like you or me or any person that loves rock and roll, just grooving to that very simple 
pent pentatonic minor riff from A minor, and it just kind of goes up. Is this fantastic? Yeah. Well, I thought I thought Rachel though, to try and keep you and the viewers interested because you know you never know. What, what They're interested. Yeah. I did write some notes, and I thought right, I must mention these are things that have been no mentioned on the channel. Okay, let's so I go. Thought, let's I'll go, go there. So we could go Beatles if you like. Do you want some Beatles stuff? Let's start with some Beatles. Okay, right. Well, when I was playing guitar on this, which is Daphne Guinness's album. Okay, Daphne Guinness. What year is that one, David? Uh, that was 2016, I believe. 17, yeah. maybe? Yeah, 17, 17. Yeah, recent history to me. So that one, um, th th this was the one, this is Tony Visconti um, produced of course and tony well wow. i was he likes to have things done properly and so we had two we re, we recorded it in um british grove studios in chiswick in london and um and basically there's so many things i wrote yes i did talk about my love for this week ken <laughs> and and basically um yeah so, so we're in the, in, the, in chiswick, chiswick, chiswick uh in london yeah. And when we were going in, I remember the first thing I did was I needed the loo when I got there. And so I went to the, the gents and it's an amazing studio. You can actually drive in to it and then the glass shuts behind you and you're in the reception. It's bizarre. Wow. Yeah. But I just really needed the loo. So I went in and I tried the handle. It's like, oh, oh, God. So I'm sort of standing there sort of shifting my weight from left to right. And then the, it clicks. You hear the door click. And, I, and the guy opens it. It was Keith Richards stood there. No and, way. And it's because they were in mixing one of their live albums or something. They were yeah. just on their way out, and he nicked in. And he he just he just said he just said it's all right, man. It's safe. Oh, <laughs> that, so that was crazy. So that was oh. one thing. But the Beatles thing. I know that's a Stones thing, but the Beatles thing is that Tony. We love um, the Stones too. I got uh, my Stones uh, mono box. Yeah, up. we love them. But. Tony basically, um, I think it was something to do with the EQ on the drums or something, but he had bought in from Abbey Road. He had the original Beatles four track machine, you know, the silver yeah. mixing desk and stuff that we've yeah. all seen them sit at. And I was just, honestly, people, we, people were coming in the studio and just touching it. Yeah, like I they know, might get some greatness. Well. Right. get some of that mojo. And then another one we, we got from Ab Abbey Road as well was another console at there, and it was the Dark Side of the Moon console, the Pink Floyd Dark Side yeah. of the Moon. So we, we had, Abbey Road, Abbey Road as well. And I think that was something for EQ. We, we definitely weren't recording through them, but we were recording onto two-inch analog tape. I mean, that's what Daphne wanted. Yeah. Daphne's a big 70s T-Rex -T -T and what have you fan, and so there you go. I haven't got many Beatles story. I did give Paul McCartney the thumbs up across the road. Well, that, I mean, that, yeah, at least you saw one moving about, you know, a fab. Yeah, he was wearing but, a cap. I was with Glenn, actually, and Glenn spotted him, and he went, oh, look, there's McCartney. Hey, there's and Mac I, over there, yeah. <laughs> hey, David, here's a question. David, are you a drummer who plays guitar, or do you now see yourself as a guitarist who plays drums? I, I, I think I still... don't see either. Yeah, it's just, it's whatever cap fits at the time but i definitely was a drummer that played guitar for a long time because i played drums from the age of five till 12 and then i started looking at the guitar and what have you but in holy holy i was the bass player so you know yeah it's like it's whatever comes up and so uh so that's my little sort of tony beatles stones thing um i was just gonna say so a lot of people keep asking me when when lemmy died did you ever meet lemmy yeah. and and again not really. Um, uh, a friend of mine was supporting Motorhead. I went and I was walking down a backstage corridor trying to find my friend's dressing room bit. And then yeah. from around the bottom of the corridor I walked this figure with a hat on and the boots. The and he just slowly came towards me. I, got, I was getting more and more nervous. And then just as he walked, just as he got, we got level, he just went, all right. <laughs> so that was my meeting with Lemmy. Yeah, but um, even even that well, little moment is something, right? And something for this, um, yeah. I did watch Mid Year Live whilst um, with I had to take Wolfgang Fleur from Craftwork to see Mid Year. Oh my so god! Yeah, I, I hung out with Wolfgang for a while. That was really that was really really good. Yeah. We've done the old slick thing. Yoko, would you like the the Yoko story? I'm always up for a Yoko story. What do we got well, with Yoko? I was band wise. I was with uh, Viv Albertine from the Slits. These these lovely ladies, 
no yeah, sex. Yeah, very well. Yeah, this is a famous album, this one right here. And this was what we were promoting, which was uh, Viv's solo album, Viv Albertine's solo yeah. album. And um, and we're playing the London South Bank, um, supporting Susie from Susie and the Banshees. But it was Yoko Ono's meltdown um, at, uh, it, the, at this this big thing. You know, like Morrissey's done it, and he got the New York Dolls to play, and all this yeah. sort of stuff. So, it's, so uh, Yoko was curating this thing. She'd asked Viv to be on, and she'd she'd asked Susie, and what have you? Peaches was on there as well. Um, and of course, Yoko did her own set later on. Um, but basically, when we finished our set, we thought, right, we, we, we'd like to go and watch Susie. And so we asked the people, like, where can we go and watch from? What's the best? Because, you know, we haven't got tickets. Obviously, we've got passes. Yeah, backstage got, passes. Yeah. And we said, we'd like to see Susie from the front. So they said, oh, no, you can go to Royal Box K and watch it from there. So we went, uh, so we went. To this royal box k and we just went steaming in you know we we're all a bit sort of like well, hey gigs done and what have you and we went steaming into this thing and these two massive guys in suits just stood up yeah and uh and we realized that the little figure in between these two guys was yoko ono and they came they came walking towards us and they go what are you doing here what are you doing here? and we were going well we were just on stage like 20 minutes ago where yeah. they told us we could come and watch in here and he goes wait there and he goes back to Yoko Ono and he says something to her, I don't know. And so we're, when she turned around, we're all smiling, trying to look really passive and nice and stuff. And she did that thing. She had these ridiculous glasses on, you know, the massive things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she turns around and she just sort of picked them up, looked at us, put them down, and then said something to this guy. And this guy just came up and he just grabbed us by the shoulders and he's going, no. <laughs> and he shoved oh, us into the oh, corridor. Yeah. Yo, so, uh, there's your Yoko. Uh, it's like Yoko, you invited us here, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then the other thing I was going to say, you've got some Pink Floyd fans on your uh, on your channel, I'm sure. Of course, and, we do. Uh, of course, I'm a Floyd fan. I love Floyd. Yeah, and I um I was drumming with a guy called Adamant, who I think people know. Maybe they do know Adamant. Like the Adamant. Yeah, yeah, Adamant, Adamant. Yeah. You know, goody two two shoes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And basically, um, I was playing for Glenn and Adam wanted to get up and do some tunes. Yeah. And so we did the on calls with with him. And um, so we had Adam Ant on backing vocals, Glenn playing, doing we were doing Philistine stuff. I'm on the drums. Yeah. Jim Lowe. And then um, the weird thing is, though, that after all the way through Pretty Vacant, I could see this guy standing against the side of the, you know, to the side of the audience. And he was singing along to every word and really getting into it. But he looked really familiar. <laughs> and I was thinking, why would that, why would, why on earth would that be? Anyway, so after the gig's all over and stuff, we went back to this stately home, yeah. uh, which is where we were all staying. And I walk into this room and there's David Gilmore sat there. And I went, oh my God, it was. And I was with Glenn and I said to, I said to David Gilmore, I said, was that you singing along to Pretty Vacant? like you know really getting into it and he goes oh yeah yeah my wife's a my wife's a big sex pistols fan oh yeah, and and, and glenn glenn looks and goes oh well, yeah, glenn, he? he goes yeah I, I love pretty vacant and glenn went well you you should have come up and played it with us and he he then david gilmore fired straight back he goes you should have asked me uh and i just wow. thought what a youtube clip that would have been me on drums yeah. dave gilmore on guitar can you imagine Matt Lock on yeah. <laughs> singing and, and adam Ant on backing vocals yeah, uh, that, that was amazing. So, and but I even had a more surreal moment later that night. There is so a me, Glenn, and Dave Gilmore then sat down at this lovely kitchen wooden chair. It was about two yeah. o'clock in the morning, I think. And I'd made a cup of tea and stuff like that, like you would because we're English. And, um, and then I was aware that this other guy had walked behind us and was now making himself a cup of tea. And I heard this nice, posh English voice go, Mind if I join you? And, and we turned around and went, yeah, sure, sure. And it was John Hurt, the actor, John Hurt. Oh, yes, of course. So I had, this, I had this unbelievably surreal moment, which you can't get your phone out at moments like that. You just can't. You, can't, you're well, you can't out believe what's spirit. happening. How the hell but did it, John Hurt over, end up over there? Who did he it was basically it was a music and arts festival that we were playing, and um, he was, uh, I think he got a book out, maybe. It was yeah. a sort of book, you know, literary books as well. There was uh, 
a lot of journalists that done books there as well, like Mick Wall and Chris Salovitz and, wow. you know, people like well, that. David, you know, to me, it sounds like there's a book in you. Have you ever wanted to or any even thought in the back of your mind? Jesus, yeah, I should write all this stuff down. It'd be a hell of a read for people that love rock and roll. Loads of times. But the trouble is, and here's here's the here's the trouble is like if you yeah. really want if, if I really wanted to get some viewers, I'd do. I do a podcast myself called Spinning Stories or something, and yeah. I and I I tell. But the trouble is, the best stories I can't possibly tell you, Rachel. Yeah. I can't. I've got some would stuff. On like Glenn be, would somebody like Glenn be willing to sit down and talk to you on your channel, like I'm talking with you? Hey, Glenn Maglock talks with David Donnelly, my guest today, my good friend Glenn. Hey, Glenn, let's go back. Let's take back. Talk a bit about the Pistols, what it was like. London, 1977. You guys are together. You know all this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure that would be. You know, that that'd be a thing. But the thing is, the funniest stories about whether it's Robert Smith or whether it's uh, yeah. Glenn or any of the Bowie bunch and what have you, I can't. I can't come through with it. The funniest ones just aren't repeatable. And you know, it's uh, yeah, it's a strange. It's a it's a strange setup because you do have a bit of a code of conduct. When you're with people oh very and, much you know i've got yeah. plenty of stories i could tell you about you know everyone you know but i would have to basically keep some of the stuff back mm -hmm. and and it's the stuff that you have to keep back that makes me not want to do a book i mean i don't know what i'd call it because the the title is almost famous the, the, the title almost famous has been taken um but uh i thought maybe you know david donnelly few that was close um, I, no, I think it's wonderful oh there you not go look I love this from Ian. Not the David Donnelly from Northamptonshire. Yeah. Holy shit balls. Yes, Holy it's hell. me. Yeah. Oh, look, I see Mark Mark Kaponicki's come in. Yeah, Mark's here. There there. You go. Now you're supporting other artists as well. Mark Kaponicki is a Canadian artist, but he's got uh, friends in England. I know that he's worked with uh, uh, his friend uh, over in the UK. Is They've worked a team show with the Dark Monarchy Project. Yeah. The Dark Monarchy. And so very gifted musician, multi-instrumentalist himself. So yeah, I know yeah. that there's somewhat of a mutual admiration. Uh, thing oh, absolutely, really absolutely. And those those three albums, they were the book, uh, they, you know, in the year 3073, 1, 2, and 3. And um, I am in some way on all of them. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think book two is the one that I'm actually on the album itself, and then I'm on the download cards of the, yeah. of the other one. But yeah, I, I love Mark stuff, and I, I get him to mix and master stuff for me. Oh, you know, okay. I do. Well, he, that's he's, wonderful. Yeah. He did spare me by um, Peaceful Cacophony. If you did watch the first video of Peaceful Cacophony, that's on. Yes, that's I a, have that's that a Mark on, Anthony yeah. K remastering, um, a mastering job and mixing. And also Choose Your Weapon, uh, yeah. Catharsis, that, that was mixed and mastered. And I think I th I'd like to think if he's got time, I'd like Mark. I know Denise would like Mark to do the, the whole album. You know, so what kind no. of bands did ivy play in the night but yeah um wedding present we supported the wedding present um and some of the, like catatonia the some of the brit pop bands i suppose but we yeah you're absolutely right that's it was the shoegazy thing and uh, we were on sarah records and anytime you hear that the, the phrase jingly jangly tends to come out but i was the drummer so i wasn't responsible for uh jingly jangly um but yeah that's uh that's that. <laughs> uh, Mark Kaepernicki uh, or Mark Anthony K. Uh, professionally, totally. I really admire David and his work. Uh, great guy. Honored to call him my friend. And I, it would be mutual, like we say, uh, Mark. Uh, you're a super. I mean, we appreciate you, Mark, here on this program. A very great deal. But uh, I mean, just uh, Tony Visconti. I mean, to that name alone, just because of. Uh, the people that uh, and the and the albums that are so yeah. dear to me is I think the me. reason I th one of the reasons I'll give you an example one of the reasons why I think Tony is I, you got the picture of me and him didn't you I've got it in my yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you sent me uh, some a number of uh, really great links here and uh, of course you played with them which is wonderful yeah uh, but Tony what, and, uh, Woody but uh, Tony one of the reasons I think. Tony, apart from his obviously his knowledge is that the, the track that I co-wrote on Daphne's album, for instance, we, we wrote on normal instru instruments and, and then well, I say normal instruments, you know, rock instruments and what have you, but he put a, like a, an orchestra on it. I couldn't believe it. Um, bye Terry. Um, but yeah, he put an orchestra on it. It's amazing. I've got some video of Tony conducting the orchestra, but I tell you what I'm trying to get round to without rambling yeah. and failed. 
is that one of the reasons he's such a brilliant producer is the way he talks to you. I went in to do some acoustic guitar on the track, but I'm not, which is available on uh, YouTube, Daphne Guinness, yeah. but I'm not. And I was doing the acoustic guitar on it and I hadn't done an acoustic part. And I went in there and he said, he just said to me, Hey Dave, can you just go into booth number two and uh, put the guitar on? So I thought, yeah, okay. He said, I think we need a bit of acoustic on this. So as a rhythm thing. Yeah. And so, um, so I put this acoustic on. I was a bit nervous because I'm an electric guitarist and, and acoustics have a wider neck and stuff. And I just thought, oh, God, I wasn't ready for this, you know. Yeah. But it's my song, so I know how it goes, you know. Yeah, and the action is usually a little higher. Yeah, than yeah, exactly. You get blisters on my fingers. Um, and uh, But basically, I said to him, okay, Tony, what do you want? Do you want me to, like, chug, 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 Or do you want me to, you know, like, pick or arpeggios or do 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 and he just really calmly just went, John Lennon rhythm guitar, Dave. John Lennon rhythm guitar. And I knew exactly what he meant. He meant this. Yeah, the chunk. Yeah, the chunk up, down, chunk, up, yeah. down, up, down, yeah. up, down, up, down. And that's and yeah. so I did that and I got it in one take. I left the last chord hanging and I was sweating because I was thinking, this is the voice about to come through the, the headphones. And this is the guy, Bowie heard these through the headphones. M Mark Bolan, Altered Images, Manic Street Preachers. Yeah, everyone you know heard that voice go through, and he went, Yeah, that was great, Dave. Do you want to come through and have a listen? It's just like, ah, oh, holy yes. shit, yeah, that's because that's, that's, I that's do remember this is, another, this is another thing. I this is one for the musicians watching, right? Because it's so painful. But we did this take of something, and um, the bass player, oh, I won't name because he's brilliant, he's fantastic. And Tony never does anything out of uh, maliciously or whatever, but no. he just doesn't faff around that, that people are paying him too much money for him to just ass around. We can't, this take had been done and stuff. And then he was, he was going through a lot of breakdown of it. And he goes, and uh, and the bass on this is uh, it's just awful. Oh, <laughs> and this poor guy. Oh, goes, my God. I'd and, be crying. And he goes, um, bass player, he goes, I'd be dying. So he said, uh, okay, Tony, what, um, what, do you think, what do you think I should do next time then? And he goes, just anything. That you just don't do anything that you did last time. Oh my God. <laughs> but it's that great because that guy went and nailed it. He went and nailed it because it's just oh, that sort of straight that talk. That is so crushing, man. And, and I know another, we had a bit of a problem in the studio, which I won't go into because it's private stuff. But there was a bit of a sort of, oh dear, there was someone in the studio that was causing a bit of trouble. You know, yeah. Just, Jim, you know. Yoko. I don't know what the hell, why? <laughs> Get her off the amp. And Here basically, they, him amp. and Tony and Daphne and this this guy went to have a little talk by themselves um, yeah. in the in the in the room at the back of the studio, and then he came out and the guy that they were talking to apparently just headed off and went home and he and we, he never came back he never came back. I don't mean they killed him. I mean they <laughs> they just he just didn't come back to the studio. Yeah. Um, yeah. But basically, I said to Tony when he came out there, I went, oh dear, I said it's a bit of a bit of a bad day, isn't it? Yeah. And he he said no, Dave. No, he said uh, there's never a day, never a bad day in the studio, Dave. There's a Dave. There's there's a bad hour. There's a bad hour. There's a bad afternoon, maybe, but there's never a bad day in the studio. I knew what he meant. He, I, yeah. I think what he meant was we should be just bloody grateful that someone's paying us money to play with yeah. all these toys. And you think great. somebody like Visconti working with the egos of somebody like Mark Bolin and yeah, uh, David yeah. Bolin. yeah. And at their height, they're making these. Visconti is at, is right there making these classic, classic. Albums. I've often thought to myself, what must it be like hearing for the first time? I've got a new song. I'd like you to, hear, you know. And suddenly you start hearing, you know, your dirty, sweet, clad in black. Don't look back, and I love you. And you're going, yeah. my God, you. And you're sitting there in the booth hearing this go through for the first time while it's happening. Mm. I think of it often with George Martin and the Beatles. But also with bands like Pink Floyd, you know, that's nothing. It's just called, you know, us and them. I hope you like it. Here we go. You know, yeah, well, it's, it's, but that it's always cool. happens, doesn't it? I mean, it wasn't um I think every breath you take was a was a throwaway. Oh, I don't think yeah. I don't think Sting I don't think Sting had really thought it was gonna do it. It nearly didn't make the album, I think. And then someone heard it and said, and you what should put that as a single, you know. Yeah, and what and of course synchronicity, I mean, yeah. at the very height, police were never bigger than they were. 
when yeah. synchronicity came out, they ruled MTV and the airwaves and uh, top of the pops, I guess, over in the UK. one for one for the geeks again is uh, when I recorded the Atlantic Machine stuff, um, the drums and what have you. We uh, we went into a studio, me and producer Jim Lowe, we went into the studio and I said, Why'd you pick this place? Because it's you know, it wasn't one we've done. He goes, It's the regatta de blank desk, Dave. It's oh. the regatta de blank desk, yeah. So yeah, we, we played yeah. through that. That's that was pretty that was pretty cool. Um, that's, yeah, that's another one I'd be out there. I'd be touching all the storied gear, trying to catch some mojo. Uh Ian from of course uh, the pride of uh Northens, Northamptonshire. When was the last time you were in uh, Northamptonshire gigging? Uh played the played the road menders um about three or four years ago and i also stood in actually i stood in once um about again probably three but just before covid with a, a tribute band i just got someone rang me up at the last minute and said our oh, drummer can't do this susie in the band she's gig and they figured that because i've got this cure reference or whatever you know maybe i'd be able to help out and stuff and they were really cool and they said it's in northampton i went i'll do it i'll do it yeah and so i did play drums for this susie in the band she's tribute um, band which is brilliant i love doing stuff like happy house yeah. no rehearsal by the way they just literally gave me the set and i listened to it on the new you know on, on the way around yeah um, now david are you a are you a future looking guy or do you have a nostalgic streak in you that goes back looks fondly like the old days as a kid in Northampton? i'm so excited about the stuff that gets created when it when it's new and stuff but yeah, yeah absolutely i do i mean i love I'll watch documentary after documentary of the punk days because although I was wanting it and being, I was just too young to join in. So I love looking at that yeah. stuff. Um, uh, one thing I share with Michelle from Choose Your Weapon is just an absolute love of Woodstock and all things Woodstock. It just, what yeah. a crazy time. I love that documentary. We're always searching out like, you know, new stuff about it. And uh, you should, if you want a real girl on here, uh, we, I mean, we're not. Yeah, we've been hunting. We're trying to get them. It's very. So we should maybe, you should maybe get Michelle on. She lives in Banbury, nowhere near me, unfortunately. I've she's been to hunt. Banbury, bloody hell. I've yeah. been to Banbury in Oxfordshire. So Banbury. she's 150 miles away. But she collects Woodstock stuff. She's trying to collect a single from every band, that, a that single that played there, that played there, but also, yeah. like, hope, preferably the song that was in the set list that they played there. That was there, yeah. And she's collecting all the coloured vinyl reissues of the Woodstock albums, one, yeah. two, three, four, five, and stuff. She's got the originals. and So, uh, yeah, maybe you should get her on. She's a real girl, a real woman. And uh, uh, real gals. They're hard to find in the vinyl community. It's a bit of a sausage fest. People have called it that. I love someone who just said Dave is a legend that, from the prog corner. Now, I wonder if that's because, one thing I was going to hold out, this is Clive. Clive Mittens, the Sea Life Project and the Age of Insanity, which is uh, Clive was the bass player for Twelfth Night. Yeah. Um, and Shakespeare is bleeding Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> and so this was the this is the I think this is probably the closest I came to being in a prog band because there there are songs in on here that are about fourteen minutes long I think, and um, there was a lot of noodling, a lot of guitar noodling, um, yeah. and Mark Spencer was in the band as well. He's from. Um, Oh, lots of bands he's, he's played with. Uh, yeah, a brief day. commercial. I want to do a brief commercial for Prog Corner. Folks, if you love prog, progressive rock, you know, bands like King Crimson, yes, yeah. Marillion, even, uh, yeah. Yeah, as our friend Ian likes. Uh, prog Corner, Scott at the Prog Corner is absolutely, uh, he's a great gentleman. Uh, he's uh, an engaging host, uh, one of the best we got in the vinyl community. The Prog Corner. You can subscribe to him. The name is the channel. Head over there, support him. Uh, you won't be disappointed. I'm a, I'm a big fan of this guy as well. I like, uh, I like some of that stuff as well. I, I do watch that. Yeah, Twelfth Night, awesome. Yeah. So Mark Spencer and Clive Mitten were in that band with me. Um, there, he'll know who they were. Yeah. I'm and, uh, and I was going to say, don't get me started on Robert Fripp. Oh, Fripp. Now what? Now why not get you started on Fripp? What's going on? Because he's such a talented man and he's such an incredible guy, but he is an. I've, I've I've seen him. I'm not saying he's just generally like this, but I've seen him just be an absolute. Wanker. Well, is he a misanthrope? I mean, you know, does he hate his fellow man? Does yeah, he, I uh, think so. Yeah, I know, don't think he, yeah. He it's doesn't really, suffer a fool gladly, I suspect. In no way at all, and and you know, you're allowed to do that and stuff. But I have watched him be on a couple of occasions just 
pointlessly rude to people who probably have spent thousands on his yeah. music and stuff. I, and I, I haven't I, seen the new uh, King Crimson documentary in the Court of the Crimson King. I watched the trailer. I watched the trailer. The I, can't wait. Just, I can't wait for that. It's just riveting. Absolutely riveting. But, I mean, he's married to Toya as well. I was a massive Toya fan um, mm -hmm. when I was a kid, you know, 79, 80, 81. And I loved her punky stuff, you know, the first three albums. Yeah. And then I was doing this thing, this 80s rewind thing, and Midge was on it, Toya was on it, Nick Hayward from Haircut 100, and all that sort of thing. And I was waiting in a corridor to go and speak to Nick, and Toya started walking up the corridor and stood next to me. And uh, and I thought, oh, wow, this is, this, is, this is my moment to sort of say what a big fan I am sort of thing. And I was, I was cool about it because, you know, we're all artists or whatever, you know, and I just yeah, said, yeah. hey, that's it. I said, it's nice to meet you after all this time. And uh, I, I said, I've been a fan since, you know, I first saw you 1979. And mm -hmm. uh, I said, really good. Enjoyed your set and everything. And she sort of looked at me. So I just looked at me like this. And she went, what star sign are you? And oh. I went, I went, um, I'm that a Leo. Could a good, that could be a good thing. I, I said, I'm a Leo. And she went, mm, yeah, fascist. And fascist. I said, I, I said, I beg your pardon. Fascist. Yeah, and I said, it your star sign. And I said, I beg your pardon. And she went, Yeah, it's all about you, isn't it? Everything's about you. And I just, I didn't know what what to say because, oh, like, it was. Yeah. I was basically saying what a fan of hers I was that I'd gone yeah. to the gig and and stuff. And I'm not nervous in front of fa famous people. Fuck that, yeah. you know. It's, but luckily, I got saved because uh, I think it's Jem, Gary Newman's wife, came out of some other dressing room. And that's obviously who Toya had come to see. And she was, oh, Toya, or whatever. But that was a bit of a disappointment. They yeah. say they say don't meet the heroes. But I, I've met so many of mine. And I'm I'm, I'm good. Oh, I wish I did. Play, sorry, I'm just going Scotty Strickling here. Yeah. Um, I didn't play on uh, My Little Philistine. But I have got the vinyl. I thought it was amazing. It's really, really good. That I think it's Chris McCormack from um, oh, a million bands, but Three Colors Red. Uh, he was in uh, in loads of stuff. But Chris McCormack played guitar on it. I think it's Chris must on. Let me hold on a sec. Yeah, I was just watching a documentary on somebody who's a, like a total punk rocker, and he goes, "Oh, I love Prague." He goes, I'm, "A lot of my influences are Prague." I just laughed, and he was talking okay. about Steve Howe being his favorite guitar player. I, I can't remember who it was. I was just reading it. I've got the this is the Glenn Matlock first solo album on vinyl. It's quite a rarity there, so I've got yeah. the seven inch of of My Little Philistine. But I'm just going to see who is on. Sorry, the familiar sound of yeah, vinyl. Yeah, we are. That's uh, ASMR for our crowd. Yeah. Um, so who is it? All right. So, oh, Keith Baxter from um, from that as well. Yeah. So it's basically three colors red. Yeah. Um, are the backing band on this? Plus the Derwood Andrews from the band that True. I have. You know, who Derwood Andrews is. David He's Andrews. Derwood. Derwood. Derwood Andrews. All right. He's this man on Generation's King Rocker single. Oh, okay. On now, Orange. This is Generation. Oh, the only thing I know about that is uh, that was Billy a Billy Idol. Idol's band, isn't it? And I have all four, and they're all on. You know, there's they're, Billy. Here. They're on four different colors. I saw Billy Idol two weeks ago. Yeah. Now Billy was part of the first wave of uh, punk rock. There, I mean, he's right in the scene. He's a very young guy at that time. Yeah. The Generation X did, pardon the pun, generate a little bit of excitement back in yeah. the day, and that before he became a superstar and synonymous with MTV and maybe even yeah. the excesses of a very slick, very polished. But I saw both. I, I saw both these two guys last. Uh, two weeks ago because they did they were supporting Blondie and Iggy as part of Generation Sex with right. uh, Steve, Steve Jones and Paul Cook from the Pistols Holy crap. plus these guys and it was brilliant they just did Generation X songs and Pistols songs wow that wow. was amazing it's absolutely brilliant it's a brilliant and for them because it's taken them all way back when before really you know Billy Idol became quote the the iconic uh uh, individual is Stephen. She said Derwood Andrews was also in West in Westworld. World, yeah. And I'm really trying to Stephen. If you like Westworld, I'm I'm really trying to bully Elizabeth Westworld into in, into reforming Westworld and having me wow. in it because she was a she she sang backing vocals on a lot of the tours that I did with Glenn Matlock. Yeah. And Elizabeth Westwood is such a good singer, and she's just such a great personality. And I, I obviously we all fancied her on top of the pops when 
they were doing Sonic Boom Boy by Westworld. And, um, yeah, I just keep saying that every now and again, every time we meet, which is like a couple of times a year, uh, as you normally, and I always say to her, I always say, oh, get Westworld back together again. Get Derwood over here. I'll do drums or I'll, you know, oh, he's got to go off. But I just want to do, um, I'm going to ask anyone listening, right, if they if they understand this feeling. So I've just showed you these four colors of King Rocker yeah, by yeah. Generation X. Now, these are responsible for knowing when a relationship I had at the time, I just knew it wasn't going to work out because we were playing records. Or I was playing records while we were chatting and doing stuff. And I got these out and I was staring at them, trying to work out which one to play. Shall I play the red one? Shall I play the pink one? Shall I play yeah. whatever, you know? And this girlfriend that I'd got sort of was looking over my shoulder and she went, is that the same song on four different records? And I went, yeah, yeah. She said, well, what are you choosing then? I said, what colour to play? And she looks like a dog that had been thrown, shown a card trick. Do you know what I mean? She just yeah, had she that didn't get it. She completely didn't get it bemused, like, mm-hmm. it's the same song. And on the B side as well, which is Give Me Some Truth by John Lennon. Oh, well, yeah, fantastic. Well, I love John. But, yeah, these these I always think of these as being re- responsible that for the moment the penny drops, and I thought, we're not going to last love. <laughs> <laughs> but it's everybody's different, you know, and not everybody gets the sensibility. <laughs> uh, clearly, David, you know, you're a true artist, uh, yeah. uh, the soul, the soul of an artist. It's wonderful. And the great career you've had and, and looking back on things and the people you've rubbed shoulders and continue to rub shoulders with. Indeed. And it's nice to be within that, uh, let's call it a fraternity, a sorority, you know, within that uh, of yeah. other people mix. Even if some are, uh, as Massey might call them, wankers. But yeah. there's still, for every wanker you meet, there's some really down to earth people that are big names themselves that are Absolutely, the salt yeah. of the earth. They're just nice people. They love, and they're all, they love that. They're music. all like, they're all like us as well. It's like, you know, I, um, you know, you know, I'm playing guitar in Visage, doing oh, the, yeah. Job, yeah, doing the John McGinn. So, so we went to this massive festival, um, co headlining with uh, orchestral maneuvers in the dark. Yeah. And band, the following really day, good. the Human League were on and, and all that sort of thing. So it was a really good good thing there. And I just remember we were all put into the same hotel. So you've got this one hotel that's just full of, like, all these 80s acts. Yeah. And and honestly, it was, again, another one was going to Norway with Glenn's band and stuff. And we were playing with the, the Stranglers and, and, and people like that. And they put us on the same coach either end and we went over on the same flight. It was like the the most awesome school trip ever. It was just like you were when you're at school, people flicking things at the back of people's heads. Um, you know, Jean-Jacques Bernal and Glenn talking about the football. Um, uh, soccer, sorry, you know. Yeah, and, no, um, football, we know, we know what it means, yeah. All that sort of stuff. And it's just, I love that weird normality that you get. I mean, I remember seeing one of the, one of the girls from the Human League really... Worse for wear, shall we say? Yeah, every, uh, she had over imbibed on one thing. I think she had. I think she had, and I, I slightly rescued her because I don't know how she would have made it to a room if I hadn't got into the lift after she got in. <laughs> David, there's a place for you at the round table. I tell you, a very uh, chivalrous uh, uh, move on your part. Whoops, so let make you go smaller. Sorry, I just hit the wrong wrong button. In all my excitement. Uh, yeah. David, we've been here for 90 minutes. That's a long interview. Oh, absolutely. That's that's longer than some really good no, films. So whoever no, no. is watching, whoever's I'm watched gone. any of it, thanks. I'm gone. No, I think it's fantastic. And I, I really enjoyed uh, talking with you. I want to put in more than the link I've provided. I want to put in a bunch of stuff. David, I'm going to pick up that album from you. Uh, if I pick up an album, are you able to sign it for me? Do something like that. Do you mean, do you mean the single, the Venus yeah. Rats and single? Yeah, yeah. What, what the one that's available. Uh, what do we got? Yeah. Crashing the, the, up the Venus. I've got the Venus reaction. Yeah, I'll yeah. sign it for you. Yeah. Sign it on the back there, yeah. and uh, or on the cover. We'll sign it wherever the hell you want to sign it. <laughs> and uh, I just want to thank David Don Lee, folks, Don Lee, for mm-hmm. being with us uh, here. Uh, the pride of both Northamptonshire and Norwich, England. <laughs> and I tell people my one little bit of uh, Anglo-Saxon DNA actually comes from County Norwich. So uh, yeah. that's just the way things go. Please support David. He's got a channel. He doesn't care about subscribers. But if you want to encounter more of David, and I'm sure you do after this interview, uh, head over there and make that happen. If if you're interested in any of the things we've spoken to, there's usually something on my channel about it in there somewhere. Um, And the Venus Reaction channel has actually got everyone recording their stuff, like Amy. There's in the studio with Amy. 
um, and and me and Ed from the Dark Masters. You know, it's footage you've never ever seen before because it's it's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and the thing is, yeah, if you want to go there, if you want to subscribe, so that every time I pop something up, if you'll excuse the expression, yeah. Um, oh God, I'm so bad at support it. independent artists vinyl community. I know many many of you do, and uh, I'm I know that I, you know it's very easy to speak for the artists in question that mm. they are all very grateful for the support that way, isn't it? it great I am. And I'm just glad. That, I'm glad I've just done enough things to keep myself going as well and um, and, and all that sort of thing. And do, uh, like I say, I know some people probably think that you or me, we're, we're giving sort of Mark in Project Gemini, you know, we give them boosts because they're friends of ours and stuff. But he wasn't a friend first. He was, you know, do you know what I mean? It's like the he's genuinely different. brilliant, that guy. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be able to push something if I thought people are going to hear this and it's going to be crap. Yeah. Um, well, and I I enjoy your uh, music. It's a lot of fun. There's some amazing thing. There's a video of David playing uh, out there. I got to check this again. There's videos of him playing. I'm going. I'll get it for you. Uh, where he's on. He was playing with Cl uh, Keith Levine from. Uh, yeah, yeah. Montreal. And he's oh, there's another one of them with Earl Slick taking the stage. David's there. Working the drum kit on that. One. I think he's you're working the drums with. Stuff. Yes, yes. It's Atlantic Machine, so cold live yeah. at Bowood. That's what so, that is. Well, well, I'll provide links for this after the fact, but David, uh, and I'll put the link for there. But there's, there's probably a few. If you look in the once this is posted, check the links and say, yeah. "Oh, Rachel, can you put this one? I want to do that for you as well." Yeah, just go go to my channel. I'm not trying to flog myself. I'm just saying, you know, go to the channel. There's probably some interesting stuff if you like anything yeah. along those lines and that. Um, He's just a right yeah. geezer, all right? He's a whole decent a right guy. Geezer. And I, I will pop up on this channel, hopefully, as a record collector all the time, because I get excited. I Just one last thing. Yeah. I I, I'm a producer as well, and I produced this album by Dox, Dax and Roxanne. Um, it's a lovely red vinyl version. and the uh, title? <laughs> and the red vinyl version is quite different to the CD. Now, this CD, I think I sent you a picture of Joe Elliott holding this. Yeah. Do you remember Joe Elliott from uh, Def Leppard? Joe Leopard? Elliott from Def Leppard, yeah. absolutely. And he was holding a couple of He's my age. Yeah, but this, the cover of this, was done by the same guy that did the Evil Dead posters and also did uh, the Cramps to the Bone. Oh, my uh, God. No, wow. not to the Bone. Is it? Someone's going to correct me. The Cramps. Fix I've got it up there. It's the 3D cover one for by yeah. the Cramps on the Bone or something like that. But, yeah, that's an amazing, that's a brilliant album. They are, if you like, even though they're a Swiss metal band, it is it is really good British rock, like yeah. new wave of British heavy metal type stuff, you know, but if you like early Def Leppard, if you like uh, that sort of thing. And that's what their management asked me to deliver. And I think I did deliver that. I think one of the tracks, Ticket to Rock, spent 42 weeks in the rock charts in, in England. Wow. So Wonderful I was quite, stuff. So, Wonderful. so producer, multi-instrumentalist, you do it all, David. I'm, re I'm really grateful to you for taking time out because I've wanted to get you on here for a while now, and uh, I'm grateful to you for it. Do you know what that is? Uh, what am I looking at? There's uh, Robert Smith there. Uh, yeah, and, and that's me, believe it or not. Is that Baby You with Robert? Yeah, it oh, is. And God. would you believe that that glass contains my very first ever alcoholic drink holy shit to have that uh, in photo form i have mine somewhere but it was at a party <laughs> i think there might have been a cigarette yeah. in it I yeah know. my mum and dad didn't really drink either you know my dad didn't go down the pub or anything so like when i sort of started hanging with the cure and that we would always go to the pub yeah. you know and uh, you know because robert lived there was well, basically some band, yeah some bands are more uh alcohol oriented like else cooper famously more alcohol oriented mm. than they were you know into heroin or, cocaine yeah. or whatever it may have been but, and robert robert just said to me when we we, we sort of get and he goes he goes what what do you want dave and i said oh, i'll have a coke please and he said why don't you have a real drink you never have a real drink and i said well i don't really know what to have i've i've never had an alcoholic drink mm. and it's like his eyes lit up and he went okay i will fix he that says, he says, well, what do you like then? I went, I said, I like fizzy drinks. You know, I like Coke and lemonade. He said, do you like fizzy apple? And I said, yeah. So he said, I'll buy you a cider. And uh, he bought me a pint of cider. And I practically needed help in home after that. I was yeah. such a, I'd never had a drink before. So I had a pint of cider. And I just remember thinking the world's spinning. I didn't know what to do with myself. It was a weird, but yeah, Robert Smith bought me my 
first alcoholic drink. The, that what a hell of a great story to end up. Da, 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 da. David, <laughs> it's Friday, and I'm in love. Thanks, everybody. David Don Lee. We're going to get him back. Right now, we're going to do what we call the decompress, and we'll just get the usual nonsense going. But David Donnelly, links in the description of this video. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for everyone who, who – it must have been like pulling teeth waiting for everyone else to come. I hope Mazzy and, uh, Mazzy and the Wax and everything just there come up now. Come, out, come up now and get it exciting. Okay, we'll get them. We'll get them back. We'll, we'll leave them out there now. We're going to start a new stream. Thanks, everybody, uh, and David, bless you. Thank you. Bye Take care. Now. I'm glad it happened David finally. Donnelly. Bye. See ya.